broke cannon cannon broke cannon cannon broke cannon welcome back to the matrix well last week's return went well a lot of positive feedback which i don't deserve but in amongst the copious amounts of sex bots came comments complaints about the new color of the matrix it's blue now well you don't like it i listen to constructive criticism and you know what i'm gonna put this right and oop. matrix give us our first fact Let's never speak of this, it's never happened. Back to blue. Blue's fine. So, quick bit of trivia for the real fans. <laughs> yeah, you. I like keeping you on your toes. Who did Susan Foreman leave the TARDIS for and marry? That's right, everybody's favourite character, David Campbell, from the Dalek Invasion of Earth. Or at least, from one account of events. Oh, see, this is how I get you. The first Doctor was ecstatic to get rid of Susan. Now, this has been a fan conception for decades. It's a very strange companion exit. Very sudden, very out of nowhere, very heteronormative. Oh, there seems like a strapping young bloke that I have spoken to maybe three times. Let's abandon my dear Susan on a ruined earth. That's as close as you got to characterization for companions in the early seasons. Ultimately, I think Susan actually expressed desires to lay down some roots maybe twice in the TV show. Whereas every mention of her in expanded media seems to characterize herself as having nowhere to belong. Oh, grandfather, I want to do wifely duties. But luckily, thanks to the omniscient narrator of the target novelization of The Crusade, we know a little bit more about the thought process that went into this decision. As writer David Whitaker let us know that this was the easiest decision Doctor Who had ever made. <laughs> Brutal! But no, 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 in fairness, David seemed like a strapping young lad. And the Doctor was visibly distressed by this for the rest of his tenure, even going to the lengths of kidnapping vaguely similar looking girls. We've definitely seen companions leave for worse reasons, but none of which were ejected just as strangely as Susan Foreman. Or should I say, Susan Cameron. Because in the 21st Dalek ruined century, Susan got all she ever wanted and got married to David Cameron. Huh? No, wait, sorry, did I read that right? No decision was more difficult for Susan or easier for her grandfather who knew in his heart that she must share her future with David Cameron, a young man she had met and fallen in love with during that terrible struggle between the Dalek and his archenemies. Uh-oh. Although we associate Terence Dix as the main writer of the Target novelizations, the most fun contributor was definitely David Whittaker, as he would half remember and write stories from scratch. We'll come back to some of them another time. The gold. When these books came out, there simply wasn't that information readily available. Which hints that David Whittaker adapted these stories without even the script to hand. And then of course there's the fact that it was the 1960s and nobody cared. Hilariously, no one informed David Whittaker that the person that Susan was left behind with was one David Campbell. Coincidentally predicting the rise of beloved British Prime Minister David Cameron. For the record, David Cameron doesn't exist in the Hooniverse. Not where he's meant to anyway. In 2015, we have this Prime Minister who became a sea devil. And then there's this comic version of Maggie Thatcher, which just looks like David Cameron. Mr. Whitzcut, you weren't to know. You weren't to know, but now the words exist there like concrete. And now for arbitrary, joyless reasons, I must abide by them. In this version of events, Susan Foreman married David Cameron. Hmm, how do we make this work? My headcanon is that the Doctor himself is the narrator of this text, and then suddenly him getting a name or five wrong is very in character. Oh yes, 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 we need a referendum, Mr. Campbell. Cameron, come along, Chesterfield. Chess, Chess, Chessington, world of adventure. Haha, <laughs> he was ill. But I think on this matter, we really do have to respect the artist's vision. 
which is ex-Prime Minister standing side by side with Susan Foreman. She does go on to get involved in politics. Okay, number two. Maybe something a bit more substantial. The Doctor's other mother. This family tree is going to be the death of me. You might remember last time, in a roundabout way, that Leela of the Severed Team is the Doctor's mother. Not a sugar mama, that's Clara, but his actual genuine birth mother. From a species who are not born. Very strange stuff, but maybe that's because the Doctor was not loomed. The Doctor is half human. Oh my god, oh my god they're at my door. The angry mob, that, they're at my fucking gate. How do you keep getting my address? Safe to say, angry mobber fans and all, the Doctor being half human is not a popular fan idea. Even though back in the 60s, the Doctor was mostly regarded as a whole human, 0% alien from the far future, I, to this date, see no problem with this idea. It makes perfect sense and you know it. For the Doctor's true mother is a human, a 19th century lady called Penelope Gates. And Penelope Gates <laughs> was the inventor of the time machine. <laughs> It sounds so wrong to say as a modern fan, but I think I like this more than I let on. Penelope Gates had adventures of her own. Her first trip to 1986, picking up companions, before getting trapped in Japan, where she was saved by the Seventh Doctor, before settling down and having a secret child with the Time Lord Ulysses, a heroic adventurer member of the Supreme Council. Two travellers meeting across time and space, giving birth to a new species. Or, if you like, a hybrid. It's romantic, but it's so wrong. But that makes it all the more romantic, but canonically so wrong. In fact, I think it's rather lovely. It's intimate, it combines the Doctor's current origins with his contradictory 60s ones, and unlike some revelations, actually lends itself to new stories. Feel free to drop one of the two arbitrary arguments you lot always have, but ultimately the Doctor still fell in love with Earth before he learned his mother was from there. It still isn't his home. I don't know, I kind of like some of those Americanized 90s ideas they had floating around, but I guess being raised by the TV movie will do that to a kid. And this is just one I'll have to take to the grave. May it come any day now. It's very telling of the 90s and where the series was currently at. It's also eerily similar to the plans of the TV movie spin-off, where the series ever to pick off in America, where the Doctor and the Master, secret brothers, had to come together to find their father. I just wonder how many books in the range knowingly were trying to fulfill on this premise. And I'm all the sadder that because of fan backlash, this idea has been completely abandoned. I did not know who Penelope Gate was this time last month. Whereas the Cartmel plan is frequently discussed, pretty much embraced at this point, and very relevant, whether we like it or not. Its influences are everywhere, whereas this idea did not make it out of the 90s. Even though I genuinely believe it would open the creative avenues for new stories more than the timeless children ever could. I think Penelope Gates would have been a character welcome in the revival. There, I said it. Maybe I'm just biased towards stories with generational storytelling in them, but uh, they've got a history. The Castellan of their parents' generation, Marlin. Merlin? Marlin? It begins with an M. Found out about their secret child and almost jeopardized their existence. And to defend themselves, the Doctor's mother and father pulled a human nature on him and wiped his memories, ditching him on 1883 Earth. Yep, that's it. Go have fun. <laughs> he doesn't know who he is. For those more interested in the exploits of Penelope Gate, the wiki actually won't help you that much, but it didn't neglect to tell you that neither of the Doctor's parents told him about sex. Thanks for that. Sayward? Writer Kate Orman, creator of Penelope, intended that Ulysses left the Doctor's mother to raise him on Earth, which is why in Black Orchid, the Doctor says, I always wanted to drive a steam train when I was a boy. The Doctor's father, Ulysses, was also a recurring character in the series. Another vagrant from Gallifrey who renounced his title as a Time Lord. Ulysses, though, liked to party, with the Doctor even having to clean up after him in his blatant disregard for the web of time. Which I think is funny, anyway. 
And I think his writers knew he would not be a mainstay fixture of the series because he was erased from the series, wiping every record of him in The Matrix, and his true name made forbidden. Does that sound familiar? So if Gallifrey themselves are retconning him, I guess we are too. And fact number three. Ah, uh, this one's dumb. <laughs> Cybermen keep showing up in soap operas. A soap opera was a type of televised entertainment. Supposedly. On paper, by definition. Really, they are a pure concentrated artifact of British misery. Offensive to my ears and antithetical to what I go to media for, I've said before and I'll say again, soaps are the bane of my existence. They're the anti-who, yeah? Complete opposites in genre, variety, ambition and charm, and yet, they both persist. Doctor Who and Cory. Parallel. Coronation Street began in 1960, Doctor Who in 1963. At many points, characters have been shown to be avid Doctor Who fans, even going to exhibitions, hanging out with K9. But sometimes they're also actors on an actual TV show that exists in the Hooniverse. We know this because many different companions watch the show. Sometimes they even appear. Sometimes as actors, sometimes as themselves in character. There's a lot to say about Dimensions in Time, isn't there? And none of it by me. Moving on. Rose Tyler, for instance, was a fan, and when she went back to Earth would catch up on past episodes. I cool bullshit. Haha, <laughs> yeah, nice, she's London working class. I don't think Rose Tyler was the biggest fan of domestic life, do you? Silence, bigot! You know, the Doctor's back there in EastEnders land and we're stuck here in the past. Silence, bigot! In short, both series exist as TV shows within one another. Trust me, don't try and solve that one. Frankly, I'm sorry that I don't have more evidence to show you, but I've seen Cybermen in the background of multiple episodes. I'm sorry I can't go check 15,410 episodes for you. I guess you'll have to take my word on it. Here's the characters at a Doctor Who convention in 2008. I see you are sad. The Cybermen will remove sadness. Oi oi, Gov, my name's Bentley, and I'm having a serious moment in front of a pig slave. But of course, the Cybermen's biggest takeover of a soap opera was in EastEnders. Nah, that's a great scene. And don't get me wrong, I am ecstatic to see Cybermen keep being drawn to British TV, but it does make me question how they got a Cyberman to appear on Jeremy Kyle and film a long work day. Stay cool. Blend in. But I think the kookiest link between Doctor Who and soap operas comes in the form of Emmerdale. Because they share a writer. Lance Parkin of the Doctor Who book range was the showrunner of Emmerdale for an extended period of time. Which is probably why he wrote the Eighth Doctor into an Emmerdale novel. <laughs> what? I'm not reading this. I'm not gonna read that. I'm not strong enough. <laughs> why are there Emmerdale novels? But it does go both ways, as Lance Parkin wrote in many soap opera characters into the stakes of some of his Doctor Who novels, including the Gallifrey Chronicles, which, if you've read that book, is a very strange cameo. Specifically detailing that members of the EastEnders cast were decimated in the aftermath of the Vor invasion, which is honestly the best news I've heard all week. But sadly, like Doctor Who, Cory persists. You know that theory I have where I always say that long-running series have to change? Well, that's true for everything but soap operas. They're an evil little outlier. A stain on creativity and media. I am sorry to all of the Dimensions and Time fans out there, but First Frontier told me that it was a dream sequence had by the Seventh Doctor. So... Mmm. If the themes discussed in tonight's broadcast have affected you, please call our support line at 07071293330 and somebody at the BBC will make sure to send you a condescending email.